First up in the five-minute fringe showcase here on The More the Merrier is Dave Mackett. The play is called Cold Comfort by Owen McCarthy. And Dave, welcome to CIUT. And uh, what's your play about? Thanks, Donna, for having me. Uh, uh, Cold Comfort is a uh, play written by Owen McCafferty, uh, as you mentioned, uh, an award-winning playwright based in uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, it tells the story of Kevin Toner, uh, an Irish bricklayer who's been living uh, more or less self-imposed exile in London, England. He's uh, completely estranged from his family and hasn't spoken to his uh, father in uh, over 15 years. While in, in London, he receives word that his father has died, and through a series of events, he finds himself back home in Belfast for his father's funeral. And the play is actually set at his father's wake, and for those who aren't familiar with the traditional Irish wake, it's similar to a, a viewing or a visitation that takes place in a funeral home, except in the traditional Irish sense, it takes place in the deceased person's home with the body on full display in the living room or a parlor of the house. There's usually um, lots of food and drinks served, and it's a time to celebrate and reminisce about the person's life. Anyway, Kevin finds himself at his father's wake, and no one has showed up. So he's, he finds himself alone in the room with the corpse of his father in the uh, open casket. And then he proceeds to have a conversation with him, and it turns out that this is the, the first meaningful conversation that he's ever had was with his father. And uh, through the course of it, he real reveals how his life has been and why he left home in his first place. And the, the, the play can sound a bit heavy, but McCafferty laces it with a lot of dark humor, so he, he lightens it up a fair bit. Um, McCafferty is a, an interesting writer, uh, and this is the Toronto premiere of, of Cold Comfort. Uh, he's well known in, in Ireland and in England and in uh, Europe, but his plays have rarely been seen in Toronto or Canada for that matter. Uh, I also uh, had the opportunity with, to work with uh, my director, Rod Sabalas, uh, a director I've worked with before. And as a director, he, he's relentless uh, in the sense that he, he pushes you further than you think you can go as an actor. And uh, given the nature of this play, uh, he was the first director I thought of, and uh, I was really quite excited that he came on board with me. Anyways, I thought I would uh, just uh, give a bit excerpt to the play to give people a flavor of, of what they might see. Um, any warnings? Should we issue any warnings about uh, uh, language? Yes. Uh, being a, a contemporary Irish play, um, there's a, 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 f a bit of swearing. So. Okay. And uh, I should also add that uh, McCafferty writes uh, in uh, Belfast vernacular, so there's some Belfast slang involved uh, as well. Um, so hopefully people will get the get a flavor of it anyway. Okay, take so it away. Here we go. Do you know how I found out about all this? Stan in this pub, good day, few shillings, Kilburn. You wouldn't know that. Should know it, but wouldn't. No, fuck it, you know it now. Stan in this bazaar in Kilburn, drinking in the corner, you know. In the corner, don't want to get involved. Looking, but don't want to get involved. On my jacks, having a paint. Too early for a biff, you'll understand this. Peace and everything has to do with peace and that's me for the day. Enough readies on me to stand there and work away. Has to be planned out. A good day ahead. Good days are planned out. Get yourself full, then the evening shift weighs in. That's another story, if you're lucky. Next thing this guy is standing face to face with me. Kevin Toner, isn't it? Aye. It's me, Mickey Walsh. Know this guy from a way back. From here, like, met him on sites now and again. Drinker. Drank with him. I was thinking, that's the plan finished. Haven't seen this guy in years. He's fuck all to do. I pop into his napper and he takes a chance. On the top. No way he's ready. He's on him. And he's coming around to buy me a gargle. On the top. That's the way my head's thinking. Stick it out. Do a runner or tell him to fuck off. Some geezer I hardly knew gonna miss my day up, what? Huh? No point in doing a runner. He'll find me. Can't stick it out because I don't want to be sipping a paint half the fucking day. Tell him to fuck off. Could end up in nasty pills. Either buy him a gargle or pretend I don't know him. Pretending I don't know him will work. You just keep saying it till leave. Problem with this guy is he'll know it's a spoof and he'll hang in there and try to wear me down. Fuck it. Will you have, Mickey? A paint? I'll get you one, he says. Happy fucking days. He's on a bender, must have a tank, order a biff. Bad news, he says. What bad news? I haven't seen him in a fucking lifetime. Bad news. 
your da's dead. In Lake Flynn, make that a double, I said. Mickey's fork and out. I was about to say, not me, kid. I don't have a da. Then I remembered. I did. Been a while, you know. Forgot about you. And that is David Mackett reading from Cold Comfort, which will be at this year's Fringe. And uh, Dave, thank you for joining us. And is there a website? Yes, uh, flyingthewalltheater.ca. And up next is Tom Berend. And Tom is the executive producer with The Taliban Don't Like My Knickers. And uh, Tom, welcome and uh, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom Berend and I'm involved in a wonderful little project called The Taliban Don't Like My Knickers. But I'm not going to tell you much about the play itself. I want to tell you a little bit about the backstory. Uh, I volunteer teaching older children with severe reading disabilities, and I was posting questions to an online dyslexia discussion forum in the UK. Somehow, a dyslexic theatre company picked up my name, not realizing that I was in Canada, and Lenny, the producer, sent me an invitation to a theatre performance they were producing that weekend, a, a shoestring affair for dyslexic actors and writers in the back room of a pub. Now. I had never heard of dyslexic theater, and I, I'm betting you haven't either. And everything I had learned about dyslexia until then involved lowered expectations, extra assistance, accommodations, curriculum modifications, and so on. And how, how wonderful and inspiring that these guys were doing theater because they loved the theater. I, I, I wrote back saying I couldn't get there in time, but perhaps we could pass a hat to sponsor her company to present in Toronto. We kept in touch. And now they are bringing a new play to the Toronto Fringe Festival. The, the Taliban Don't Like My Knickers, with seven performances scheduled at the Tarragon Theatre. The Fringe is a crazy celebration of small theatre. It's the, the best entertainment value in town. I, I hope you come out for lots of plays and bring all your friends too. But in particular, I hope you come out and see our dyslexic London friends and, and their new play. Um, the Taliban Don't Like My Knickers has nothing to do with dyslexia. It's just great storytelling. It's a, a stylized two-hander loosely based on the story of Yvonne Ridley, a, a journalist who was captured by the Taliban. But it's, it's really about freedom and sacrifice, the pursuit of truth, the cost of holding to our convictions, and what it is that gives people strength. What I find most unique and different is the dyslexic imagination that drives the show. It's a very visual, very stylized, very graphic um, images are as important as words. There are two projectors running and an audio soundscape playing, all to support the, the spoken narrative. There is a written script, I've seen it, but it seems to have evolved as an afterthought. It is a wonderful theater and very, very different. You simply have to experience it. The Taliban don't like my knickers. Come and see it at the Tarragon. We're also having a talk back in partnership with the Ontario branch of the International Dyslexia Association. We'll be setting up a talk back at the end of the July 11 performance. A chance to meet the writers, producers, and actors and ask them questions. Again, July 11 only. It's intended for dyslexic students with an interest in theater or filmmaking, but of course everyone is welcome. The team in London has been working on a short documentary, uh, a work in progress that I'm hoping we'll screen then. Space is limited, however. We have to move upstairs to the Tarragon's solo performance space to give the next Fringe performance a chance to set up. We can only seat about 60 people up there. So that's the July 11 performance. I should mention that the play is a little tiny bit edgy, not really suitable for under 12. The Taliban don't like my knickers. If you Google Taliban and knickers, which is an unusual combination, you'll find this production immediately. I hope to see you there. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, definitely. Taliban and knickers, not two words I would ever put together. Uh, thank you so much, Tom, for joining us. And is there a website? Well, there is, but it's, it's long and complicated. Google Taliban and, and knickers. And knickers, okay. You'll find us. I'm going to do it. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much, Tom. Up next in the Fringe Showcase is How to Become a Spinster by Diana Galligan and Wanda Carroll. They're both in studio with me today. And uh, welcome Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. Um, it's so nice to have new faces here. Every year I do this, and every year I try to get new faces on to promote their friend show. So I want spinsters to be included and celebrated. So, <laughs> Diana, tell <laughs> us more about this play. Sure. Um, Wanda and I wrote it together, 
and uh, have developed it's our first collaboration together although we've both done one woman shows before and done friend shows before this was the first time we actually said let's do something that's new and relevant and what's going on with ourselves in our lives and it's a comedy uh, and it goes through the 10 easy steps uh, to becoming a spinster well not just to becoming a spinster 10 easy steps to the life of your dreams that's right so there are 10 easy steps can mm -hmm. we hear some of them absolutely okay the first one is to embrace your inner spinster some people don't realize that there's a spinster inside of all of us okay. and we need to embrace it yeah we do and uh, we have a lovely character named Meg who has embraced her spinster her entire life and has uh, lived a wonderful life and so it's a great example mm -hmm. to our seminar people that's right also making the commitment to being a spinster mm -hmm. How long can you make a commitment for, Wanda? You can make a commitment for five minutes, five hours, five days, or five decades. It's up to you. That's right. Oh, one of my favorites part, though, you will leave with your spinster name. That's right. You have a spinster name. Everyone mm -hmm. does. And a lot of times you don't know what it is. So we're going to help you discover it and tell you how you can use it. Which, yeah, because you can't just give them the name. We also have to give you details on how you can get use that name in your daily life. Oh, speaking of daily life, yes. Diana, we also do uh, tell people how to, uh, in social situations, because sometimes being a spinster in a social situation can be a little awkward. People ask you awkward things, like, right. are you going to freeze your eggs? <laughs> like, but they do, they ask you that. <laughs> and we don't even know what the details are for freezing eggs are, like how do you get them out, how do you get them in the freezer, I don't know. <laughs> Yes, and do we have enough space in our freezer for both sets of our eggs? Because we're roommates right. as well. I think apparently you're supposed to label them well. <laughs> yes, th this would be important. Don't want to eat them by accident. Yes, that's true. And, so there, and there are also spinster support groups as well. And we'll give you details in, at the seminar of how to get in touch with your local spinster group. That's right. And now anybody can be a spinster. I mean, men, women. Married, single, gay, straight, tall, short, dogs, cats. That's true. Because yeah. really, it's all about finding the inner, like you said, about finding the joy of your inner spinster. That's right. And just, it was really inspired by, you know, sometimes you get what you want in life, sometimes you don't, but you can love what you got. And yeah. that's really sort of where we started. Oh, that was poetic, Diana. Thanks. Yeah. Did you have any questions for us? Um, oh, I'm, well, she's I'm, laughing. That's a good <laughs> sign. Yeah. I'm still, sorry, I'm still back at the refrigerator. Be, be <laughs> <laughs> don't look in our freezer is what we're right. saying. Okay. Just don't eat anything from the freezer. <laughs> yeah, I'm not touching your fridge door. <laughs> so, um, so how to become a spinster. Um, how long did it take you to, to come up with the piece? Well, Di it was Diana's idea. And oh, we've probably written over like three months. Probably about three or four three months. Or three or four months. Yeah. And the one thing we found, and I keep saying this because it was I was found it so exciting, is when we started writing together because she had written her own show, Vivi, and I'd written my own one woman show called The Road Less Graveled. Completely, entirely different. Vivi, the first time she presented it was a uh, well, you describe it. It's a my yeah, it was the last show I did had no words in it. It was a silent film star character comedy. So I was used to writing for the moments, but not as much the words. You know, I was writing the, the structure of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mine was, uh, it's called The Road Less Gravel, and it was a collection of comedic stories about growing up in northern Newfoundland in the 70s. So we're just both coming at it from, the, and I'm coming from the theater world, and she comes more from the TV kind of, because she, do, you know, does commercials and stuff. But it was so cool when we get, we'd have a writing session, and, you know, I'd throw an idea out, and uh, and she would just pick up on it. And if I didn't even have it formulated, like this is what how I feel, and she would find the words for it. And neither one of us attached ourselves to anything in the script. So I was like, oh, you know, it works today. Yeah, it doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work two days from now. All right, get rid of it. And that was really cool. So have you modeled your your ten steps on things that uh, people have told you? Like since you've been writing this play, do people come up to you and go, oh, oh, I know what has to be in your ten steps? A lot, people done that? yes. People and people have talked about a lot of times when we talked about. We said we want to do a show about how to become a spinster. They go, "Well, have you thought about this? And have you yeah. thought about that? And you know, let me tell you something." And it was really interesting to see how excited people were when we hadn't even written it. We had written a title, and yeah. people really had a lot of things to to tell us about how great it was, things that they loved, things that they chose, whether they chose it or not. 
Yeah, and 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 we were on uh, the Annex Festival a few weeks ago, and some people actually kind of were really negative. Like they still see spinsters very negative, and it's very important. In all fairness, we were asking them if they wanted to become a spinster. <laughs> Out on the street. <laughs> That's true. On a hot day. This like, one. excuse me, you. Would you like to become a spinster? <laughs> no. oh. Surprisingly, the men responded really well. They did. That's true. Wow. They were yeah. like, yeah, I do. <laughs> There's a card. But we're kind of trying to take that word, like, because spinster has such a negative connotation, and it, there's no need for that. And that's one of the things, like, by taking it from a comic perspective, is we're changing that perspective. You know, we're changing how people look at spinster. Yeah. It's like. Being single and having one cat is okay, but if you have three, <laughs> you're a cat lady. You're a cat lady. Right? Yeah. And what's wrong with that? Exactly. Right? Exactly. You should have as many damn cats as you want. <laughs> yes, as long as, you ta- life. as long as you take care of them. That's right. My yes. neighbors used to have 16. They were a couple, mind you. But six, <laughs> 16 cats. Okay. All right. Are there any uh, sort of Newfoundland um Spinster. Well, Mag. Mag is, is our Newfoundland spinster. Mag is a Newfoundland yes. spinster. Okay. One of the oldest spinsters alive yes. today. All right. A like woman who could be an inspiration to all of us. Yes. Okay. Well, I can't wait to hear it. So, how to become a spinster? Diana Galligan and Wanda Carroll, thank you so much for being here. Is there a website if people want to check it out? Why, there is. <laughs> it's become a spinster.com. Repeat, please. Become a spinster.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Currently, St. Francis talks to the birds. And uh, Jonathan Brett of Royal Porcupine Productions is here to tell us why. And why? Why, Jonathan? Well, you know, this gentleman named David Ives wrote this wonderful piece called St. Francis Talks to the Birds. uh, And uh, our lovely director for Royal Porcupine Productions, uh, Adam Bailey, the director as well, um, picked it and it's fantastic. It's just uh, an absurdist piece and it's uh, a deadbeat, wonderful comedy with uh, <laughs> horrible, horrible, horrible uh, Jersey Shore accents, Polly, Polly from the Sopranos accents, uh, Southern accents. It's just hysterical. Um, St. Francis finds himself in a desert, uh, slightly being eaten and what have you by these vultures, and the vultures are uh, quite hysterical. Tell us about your cast. Uh, the cast we have is Anamika Wade, who's playing a transgender or drag king uh, performance as St. Francis. And uh, we also have Tanya Wrigley, who's playing uh, a female vulture. Cameron Johnston, he's playing the male uh, vulture as well. And we have a surprise character at the end that we can't really tell anything about, so unfortunately. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a surprise for everyone. <laughs> Um, ha- have you run this title past any churchgoers? Well, we do have some disclaimers about it that it, anyone that's deeply of religious may be offended. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think the uh, the play itself plays upon uh, realization of, of your faith and death and mortality and what have you and uh, pokes complete fun at it and and uh, is quite hysterical so uh, you'll find yourself in stitches from the starting of the play to the end so some of our listeners may not be familiar with the the term absurdist um, theater can you introduce that please absurdist theater is basically taking the uh, sort of a norm and then really turning it into a comedic or dark or oppressive there's quite a few different terminologies for it mm-hmm. but in this point it uh, becomes quite the comedy and uh, everything normal becomes unnormal, is basically what I can say on that one. And what would you say the theme is to St. Saint Francis Talks to the Birds? Uh, very spiritual, very much about faith, religion, uh, and uh, two sides of people that don't have faith and some that do have faith. And it's, it's very paramount in the piece without giving out any, uh, any bits for the, for, the, for the production itself. So. And what drew uh, Porcupine, Royal Porcupine Productions to this particular uh, w- play? Actually, our artistic director had uh, a death in the family, actually, and this uh, really shone through to him about faith and death and what happens. And uh, as much as it is a comedy, it was also sort of touched him very much. So uh, we're very excited about this piece. And uh, yeah, Was it at all emotional for him to, to watch the process unfold? Very much so, yeah. 
on yeah. a daily basis. <laughs> and how did how do you work? Th- how did he work through that sort of thing? I think being in any arts form, uh, myself, I'm an abstract painter. Uh, him being in theater and as an artistic director, I think you work through your emotions, your pain, your passion through your artwork, and that's um, that's quite strong in that sense, and almost like therapy in a sense. Yeah, I think that's something that um, we audience, myself, speaking as an audience member for the arts, we always wonder how um, these actors are able to go on in the face of such tragedy. It's such deep passion because you know they're on stage and doing sort of a a very heavy, heavy piece and if they've gone through something traumatic in their life or what have you, death or what have you, it's it's hard. You know, they get up there, they're troopers. (laughs) Um, I'm going to ask you this as an actor. Um, I mean... Is, do you ever feel sort of strange about using your tragedy to power your mm. art? I think that's about art therapy. That's what I've learned in my own in my own fashion. That you take your pain and you delve it out to the community to, on paper, on paint, on canvas, or on the stage. Really, so it's uh, it's very powerful. So, what's the one thing you would say to our audience listening now? to get them to pay $10 to go see St. Francis Talk to the Birds. Come for the vultures and the Jersey Shore and Polly from Soprano Accents. You will not miss a thing. Um, we also, we're doing some lovely charity. Uh, we're doing some cross-marketing with a uh, CANFAR, which is a national AIDS foundation, and it's the only research foundation in Canada. Uh, we're working with a program called Kisses for CANFAR, which is youth-based in teaching them about AIDS prevention. Uh, so we'll be doing some cross-promotion with them and giving up tattoos and other surprises. So, yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Where can people find out more about um, your play and the, and the charity work that you're doing? Absolutely. You can find us at www.royalporcupineproductions.com. You can also go onto Facebook and punch in Royal Porcupine Productions as our like page. Like us, check us out, get our information, and we also have a group page as well under the same name. And also check us out in the Fringe uh, listening books. And also, it's the 25th anniversary of the Fringe, so we're very excited to be a part of this. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you so much. And up next is Nobody's Idol. And joining me in studio is uh, Jory Rossiter, Sean Ban Beaton, and the writer Alex Lean. And uh, welcome to CIUT. Thank you. Thank you you for having us. Hey. So, Alex, since you are the playwright, um, tell us about Nobody's Idol. Nobody's Idol is a musical parody um, where misfits and wannabes duel with their voices for the grandest prize of them all, a lifetime supply of fame. Wow. (laughs) Can I sign up? (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Oh, you've already got it. Actually, no. It's like, no. I, I, I would rather not be famous. Thank you very much. I don't know why anybody's on these reality shows. Right. Um, Seriously. But, um, Jory, what's your role in so, the play? So I play Fame, the living embodiment of Fame, which is um, I'm the host, but I'm also a deity. Um, so I switch into Fame mode, and then I'm the host, and a uh, wide selection of different characters. But I'm basically the living embodiment of Fame that people want to get. So are you a... Ryan Seacrest kind of There's a little bit of Ryan Seacrest. There's a little (laughs) bit of everything, baby doll. Don't you worry about it. There's lots of characters coming your way. Mae West. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) yeah. Come on, sing some time. (laughs) Okay, and uh, and Sean Ban Beaton. What's your role? Uh, I play Derek Worm. He's one of the judges on the show, and he's as charming as his name sounds. (laughs) 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 So... Alex, tell me, were you involved in the casting? I was. Okay, and uh, what was it about Sean that made you choose him to be... (laughs) Oh, I don't know if I want to hear that. ...to be a worm? (laughs) Oh, I don't know. He was a really good singer and actor, and it's so surprising how well you embody this character, (laughs) because off stage, you're, like, such a sweetheart, and then this guy... (laughs) Can I say douchebag? He's kind of a <laughs> yeah, douchebag rock star from, <laughs> character. From the outside world, he looks like a, a douchey 90s rocker who okay. uh, hasn't realized that his career is past his prime. <laughs> <laughs> but inside, he's just misunderstood. Okay. <laughs> so, um, how many songs do you do you get to sing? How many songs do you sing? Do you um, sing in I the, have a, in a, a, a solo. Uh, okay where I prove my rock stardom. Mm-hmm. And uh, another one, a duet, uh, uh, 
sexy duet with yes, yes, uh, there's another girl, sex drugs and another character, role. Amber, yeah. in the show. Okay, and... Uh, I don't know if this is a PG-rated show here. I don't know if I should get into any details. Here. Well, uh... <laughs> People are going to want to see the show, so you need yeah. to give them the flavor, <laughs> right? Sure, yeah. So That's the whole point. Get people interested yeah, the, in the show. The duet is with uh, his like biggest fan. Who's, who's also a contestant on the show. Yeah. Ooh. She's obsessed with me. I don't yeah. yeah, and you're I a don't judge. see it, but... And he's but one of the like judges, yes. Conflict. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole show is actually a... a um, it's the final night of reality show. The final results and competition. Um and uh, lots of audience participation, and there's a couple of yeah. different endings depending on what the audience wants. Yep, the audience is going to vote. Yes. Oh, Exciting. the audience gets to vote. Oh, yes. one of yes. those. Okay. Yes. Now, do they vote by show of hands, or can they text a number? Oh, Ooh. I wish it could be that high tech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is Canada. <laughs> Where, where's the budget? We don't have <laughs> cell phones. Like, we, we can all text. Like we can all text Alex. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> you get a call from Rogers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your mailbox. You've reached your limit. <laughs> yeah. It's it's a lot of audience participation, and yeah. and there are three different endings, and it depends on vo- by voting of applause um, who they like and who they want to see get famous. Yeah. So, how many um, actual contestants do we so see? So there are four contestants. Um, so there's Amber, uh, the one who's obsessed with Derek Worm. There's <laughs> Chantel, the um, Chantel's a former. Uh, a former um, beauty queen, beauty queen, Pageant baby. Girl. Yeah, and yeah, she used to be star. on a show called Tiara's on Tots. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and so this is her <laughs> last chance at fame. Yeah. Well, she's aging out, right? Yeah. You know. Oh yeah. <laughs> and like, girl, seen better day. Um, it's like Honey Boo Boo <laughs> at twenty five or something. Yeah. Great. <laughs> and then we have JB. He's our rapper. Um, aspiring rapper. Aspiring MC, rapper. Yes. Okay. Who would like to get shot? <laughs> That's his overall goal. Oh, so yes. he'll become more so famous. So he'll become famous, like yes. Notorious yes. B.I.G. or, or you <laughs> yeah, know, okay. Tupac, you yeah. know. Yeah, but let's put the warning out there. He doesn't really want to be shot, people. So no, 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 just, just the character. Just character, yes. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then there's a... There's and a, then there's Frances Annie. Frances Annie, yeah. She believes she's Annie from the musical. Oh dear. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh a lot dear. of stable people applying for this yeah. job. <laughs> for, for this contest. <laughs> so, Alex, were you, were you watching a particular reality show when the idea came to you to do this this play? Um, I I watch all these shows and I guess it's just kind of like a mixture of every like reality show slash like fantasy movie I've ever seen. It's kind of just like a mixture of it all. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, nobody's idle. What's the website so people can visit and prep themselves for going to the fringe? The website is www.nobodysidle.wordpress.com. You can follow us on Twitter at nobody's idle to. And if you go to the Fringe Toronto website, um, you can get tickets that way as well. Okay. <laughs> is the writer as well as the performer in The Homemaker. And Laura Ann, welcome to CIUT. Welcome to The More the Merrier. Hello, thank you for having me. So this title is intriguing, The Homemaker. Not a word you hear very much anymore. No, definitely not. Definitely not. And the inspiration for this comes from? Uh, this. Uh, the inspiration actually comes from a bit of an urban legend slash story within my family on on my mother's side and it comes from a story of one of our relatives somebody who I never met but it's a story that held true for quite a few years and I was very inspired by this story and I decided to write a play uh, loosely influenced by this person's life and your character's name is Jeanette Cardinal Okay. Cardinal. <laughs> Cardinal. It's Cardinal, but she's so pretentious, it's Cardinal. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you're doing a series of cabaret-style acts? Yeah, it's definitely a, a very strong clown-influenced show. Um, I've trained for the last two years in Red Nose Clown with Adam Lazarus and Helen Donnelly and, and Francine Cote, and so... I took that influence and put it into a show. I don't wear a red nose in the show, but it's very strongly clown influenced and I do cabaret acts of, you know, puppetry, mime, uh, poetry and dance movement and it's a really fun show. Okay. So the last few descriptions that you've mentioned people are familiar with. 
red nose clown, however, people <laughs> are going to think circus. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So for, uh, for, for people like myself and others listening who may not be familiar with the fact that you have to actually take classes. Yeah, tell I mean. Tell us about that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, basically my training has been more sort of French style training. Francine Cote, you know, the mask, the smallest mask in the world is the red nose. And um, that's all you need. You don't need the makeup necessarily. The makeup was for circus, as you said, mm -hmm. but you don't need it in smaller venues. You certainly don't always need it in a show. And so it's just about je, uh, play, and finding that playful side and that joyful side of all of us. And something that Francine talks about is, you know, you celebrate what you have, as a performer, but sometimes with clown you celebrate what you don't have. And that limitation within performance is, is where the humor comes out. If you're trying your best at something, but you're not actually good in it, it's funny. So that's something that I've been exploring in my clown training. It's, it's finding your inner innocence. It's innocence plus experience. And that is clown. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Janet Cardinal, Janet Cardinal, um, is it present? Is it set in present day or no? It's actually set in uh, the prairies in the 1960s, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's really exploring the kind of stereotypes of being a homemaker of that time and and the limitations of that role for sure. And. You say this is loosely based on uh, on someone in in your family. What is it about that person that connected with you that made you want to do to do this role? Well, um, for me, it was to do with actually her story and and her bout with alcoholism and also with uh, her kind of friction relationship with her husband and and how she became an alcoholic. So that was really what drew me to her story. I don't want to get too much into the ending of the story because mm -hmm, it, it's it takes it takes away of it. Yeah. But but that definitely her marriage to the bottle and to her husband was a really strong influence for me and on why I wanted to write this story. Uh, did you finish this play before you submitted it to the fringe or was it just a work in progress? Uh, no, no, I, I finished it actually. Um, I just uh, actually, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, I just premiered it in Wakefield, Quebec mm -hmm. at a festival called the Tada Festival. And it's a curated festival and they invited me to come up and do the show. So I've already performed it. I'm mm -hmm. just uh, going to be doing a couple more performances at the Toronto Fringe too. Is it your first time at the Fringe? No, actually, I um, a couple of years ago in 2011, I've been touring for the last four years a show called Pitch Blonde, and it was just recently at the Next Stage Festival. I heard good things about uh, about Pitch Blonde, mm -hmm. so congratulations oh, on that. Oh, thank you. And, yeah. uh, so that's reason enough for people mm -hmm. to, to come and see you in, in the Homemaker. Um, is there music or is it a cappella? Um, there, there is some uh, recorded guitar music in the show, and uh, there's, yeah, I think I, I do sing a song in the show, and um, yeah, I, my boyfriend is a guitarist, and he recorded the track for me, which was great. Okay. Yeah. Cheap artistry. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> convenient. <laughs> convenient, more like. <laughs> so that's wonderful. Work it into the play. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so how do you think, do you think there will be a difference between the audience in Quebec and the audience here in viewing it? Yeah, I mean, the audience in Quebec <laughs> was one of the most lovely, generous, but I've had the same experience in Toronto. So I think that I, I will find an equally intelligent and warm audience here. I've, 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 you know, I've directed shows at the Toronto Fringe. I've done my own show and... I find the audiences here are just lovely and very intelligent and really want to engage in the show. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, yeah. I Do they laugh at different things? Yes, I think so. I mean, the humor will be different. I mean, in Wakefield, they got, they're, they're a bit of a raunchier crowd. <laughs> so they, they laughed at the raunchier bits in the show, which was great. And, you know, it, every audience is a different beast, right? So they're going to laugh at different things for sure. Well, thank you so much, Lorianne Harris. And is there a website that people can visit for The Homemaker? Definitely. Um, they can visit either the Fringe Toronto website, so fringetoronto.com, or they can visit my website, 
Laura and Harris and with an E dot com. You're listening to the next guest here on the Five Minute Fringe on The More the Merrier. This is Alex Eddington. The play is called Yarn. Hi. So Yarn, there are three things I want you to remember about it. First of all, true story. Secondly, live music. Thirdly, cool venue. True story happened to me 10 years ago. I was traveling around Europe, the United Kingdom. I was 23 years old. I needed a job. So I ended up taking a chambermaid position in a little hotel on the Isle of Mull, which is on the west coast of Scotland. Lovely place, very isolated, and the loneliness kind of got to me. So what I like to say is I went there to find myself, but I lost my mind instead. One of the things that happened to me is that I became very superstitious, and I'm going to share an excerpt that uh, is all about that. Uh, second point, live music. I play ukulele, which you've heard and you're, you'll hear uh, in a little bit. I also play baritone horn, and I play dumbek, which is a Turkish percussion instrument in the show. Uh, music has a few different roles in the show. Uh, it, there are Scottish folk tunes. There are sheep anecdotes with baritone horn accompaniment. But it's also the music of the inner monologue. So do you know when you get a song stuck in your head and it loops around and it, it becomes just one little part, like a few notes that are looping around and they get more and more perverse and the words start changing and it almost seems like your inner monologue is mocking you? Okay, that happens to me all the time. So I, I, that, things like that weave through the show. And if you're wondering why I'm singing in a bleating voice, you'll just have to come to the show to find out. Third thing, cool venue. I'm at the Majlis Art Garden, which is a new fringe venue. It is exactly one half rose garden and one half theater. Uh, you're sheltered from wind, you're sheltered from rain, but there's garden all around you, and you're looking into this beautiful little intimate theater. And because we're doing this in the evening, the light will actually fade over the course of the show. It'll be very beautiful. And after my show each night, I'm hosting guest acts. I'm doing this kind of rogue sub-festival called the Wind Down Festival. And you can check that out on my website, Alex Eddington. Dot com. That's Eddington with two Ds. So I'm going to do a little excerpt from Yarn. It was like good and bad luck were fighting all around me. Of course, only part of me believed that. Do I love you because you're beautiful? Or are you beautiful because I love you? Later in August, I went to climb Ben Moore, the highest point on the island. 3,300 feet up a gentle green slope from the edge of the sea. I biked down the night before, and I parked my bike, and I pitched a tent, and I skipped stones into the waves while the line from an old Rodgers and Hammerstein song skipped in my head. Are you weird because you're lonely? Or are you lonely because you're weird? Ben Moore always has its head in the clouds. But that Sunday morning sky was the clearest of the entire summer. And then I got to be alone up there, just me and the view for half an hour. Are you a recluse because your hair is long? Or is your hair so goddamn it get a job, you dirty hippie long? Because you're a recluse. Of course, other people came up the mountain. And one guy was like, Toronto? You're from Toronto? Those guys are all in the dark right now! Because that was the summer of that huge blackout. The biggest since 1976. The same month that Mars was so close to Earth that it cast a reflection. Great weather, easy descent, no one had stolen my bicycle in the last seven hours. Well, that's just normal. But anyway, so much good luck in one day. I sang as I struck my tent, loaded my bike, rode off, and then... So I sit on a rock, take off the wheel, patch up the tube, pump it up, reload, remount the bike, ride about 300 meters, and then even faster. And a third time, wheel patch, pump, load, mount. I try to flag down a car, but no one will stop for my dirty bike. But a pickup truck stops, and they've got room, and their farm is only one mile down the road, and they have aerosol tire sealant, but it doesn't work on bikes. But one guy is driving into Salon right now, anyway, and there's a bike shop there that is open on a Saturday, but I have to leave the bike overnight, which means hitchhiking home now. I call the hotel, they're busy with dinner, they can't get me for five hours. But every two hours, hundreds of cars come zinging by on their way from the ferry, but not one will stop for me, I who had been hitchhiking all summer. So much good and bad luck superimposed. This was deliberate. This is Alex Eddington. My fringe show is called Yarn. And if you want to read more about it, it's uh, you can go to my website, which is www.alexeddington.com. That's A-L-E-X-E-D-D-I-N-G-T-O-N dot C-O-M.
Joining me in studio next is are, I should say, Evan and Victor to talk about Fort Isabel. And uh, Evan, I want to start with you. What was the inspiration behind Fort Isabel? Sarah Miller Garvin, who's our playwright, Mm -hmm. uh, she started writing the show after finding out that hate crimes against queer people are actually on the rise, even though we hear so much less about it in the media. And Sarah was interested in representing the impact of homophobia on children who grew up to be queer. Uh, She and I both have received negative messages towards queer people while we were growing up, including media coverage of hate crimes and the AIDS crisis. These messages stay with you and can affect your sense of self, particularly as you uh, come to terms with your sexual identity. You have to be careful what you say to children because they can grow up to be queer themselves and that was really uh, what she wanted to explore in Fort Isabel. Can you tell me more about the creative process for the show? Sure. So Sarah initially came up with the idea for Fort Isabel last summer and after working on the script by herself for a few months she approached me with the idea and asked if I was interested in directing the show and working with her on the script as dramaturg. As soon as I heard the storyline, I knew it was a project I wanted to work on. Sarah and I share a lot of the same politics and are equally invested in the representation of queer persons in theater. So I think we've been able to collaborate in a way that really strengthens the script and the production. Now, the the story is set in rural Mm -hmm. Ontario. Um, What's it going to look like on stage? Well, the show explores the way in which events from our childhood shape our understanding of ourselves and our identities as adults. That's really the the main theme and at the core of it. And um, in a way, we can never really escape our childhood or our past because it affects our perception of the world and who we are. So this is what we wanted to represent on the stage, as well as uh, secrecy. So... Um, We're going to have an actual fort on stage, which is really exciting, and it's designed by Anna Standish. And the design has a childlike aesthetic, but with dark undertones. And part of those dark undertones are related to the secrets uh, that we'll be exploring, and particularly looking at how secrets have a tendency to bond people together, but can also tear them apart. Um, you mentioned the fact that um, hate crimes are still on the rise. Um, besides that point, um, how do you think the show is relevant today? Well, the children find a male body in women's clothing, although the identity of the person is unknown. And Jen and Clinton both struggle to understand the motivation behind this hate crime and are deeply affected by it. The play explores growing up in rural Ontario as opposed to in the city, and the homophobia and transphobia transphobia that are still strong and uh, very, uh, that remain prevalent today. However, that's not to say that the city is a safe haven for queers either. Over the decades, we have seen a growing awareness of LGBT issues in metropolitan urban centers. However, we often forget that these changes, this awareness, are actually quite locational. While more gay and straight alliances are popping up in our city schools, in the rural community, uh, they're still sort of lagging behind in this respect. We're told it gets better, but we want to explore where it gets better and for who exactly. Because even now in Canada, we have our own dark corners of intolerance and hate, violence and death. And Fort Isabel takes place in one of these corners. And it's a place where keeping a secret can be the difference between life and death. I think Fort Isabel provides a voice for youth and marginalized members of the LGBT community. During the dramaturgical process, we were adamant about setting the story in present times, as opposed to 20 years ago because we wanted to let people know that these issues are still relevant and very prevalent today. Fort Isabel is a play that relates to the universal experience of trying to interpret childhood memories and understand what they mean for your adult life, and also speaks to a very specific experience of growing up queer in Canada today. Whether we're aware of it or not, we all know members of the LGBTQ community. 
Um, Clinton, um, Evans uh, spoke really well um, about the fact that, you know, we have this, um, it's getting better, but which is good, but it's, it's not better for everybody yet. Um, tell us about Clinton and his journey. Right, so Clinton is my character in the play. Um, and I think I think the best way to describe him um, was to say that he's on the threshold of becoming an adult. And I say that because he's forced by these, these rural tendencies of, of small town Ontario to uh, for him to make adult decisions about his identity, his friends, his place in the world. Um, he's a gay 17 year old in small town Ontario. Uh, and he's just not living in ideal circumstances. Uh, he, and he's kind of being tugged from both sides. So there's his own moral sense of identity telling him to be true to who he is. And then on the other side, there's his parents, his best friend, uh, pretty much everything he's ever known in his life, uh, condemning being gay and kind of making him feel unsafe. And then on top of that, there is this dead body, as Evan mentioned, um, this memory from his childhood haunting him and shaping his view of the world and the queer community. So I guess the journey that Clinton goes through, um, it's kind of one of deciding what and how much to leave behind in order to be true to himself. And um, your experience um, in this role, how have you decided um, what to show and what to leave behind? What's been your, your experience? Uh, the experience has been an interesting one, actually. Um, I mean, these are really important issues to a lot of people, and I think that every day people, young and old, go through these well, and on a daily basis. The beauty of Fort Isabel, from my perspective, is that it doesn't force the audience to think anything. It doesn't force the audience, doesn't force any kind of idea on the audience. And I don't think that's our job as actors. Um, our job is to stir conversation. And ultimately, I think Fort Isabel is a piece that people are going to leave and they're going to talk about not only the plot, but the bigger issues at hand and kind of just talk about what needs to be done in the world. Well, I want to thank you both for joining me today to talk about this issue, and I hope a lot of young people come out and see Fort Isabel and the website. Uh, yes, we, we can be found online at fortisabel.tumblr.com and also on Facebook. Joining me next in the booth is Richard Willis, and Richard and Heidi Reimer have uh, written Strolling Player up at the Fringe, and Richard, welcome to CIUT, welcome to The More the Merrier. Thank you for having me here. Uh, my pleasure. So, uh, you are the cast I am. in Strolling Player, you're the player, so um, tell us, Richard, why should people pay their $10 to come and see you? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I don't. Okay, I, end of interview. No, that's it. <laughs> no, that, that, that's my pitch right there. Um, it's called Strolling Player, and um, it's called Strolling Player because that's what I am. I'm an actor, and uh, I've done it for a long, long time. And uh, the, the way it came about, uh, the way the, the, the piece came together, uh, was when I, when I came to Canada... Um, and I came for my resident card. I was uh, to get into Canada. You 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 have to supply this information. You have to say where you've worked, where you've travelled, and where you've lived from the age of eighteen. And my age of eighteen is is quite a long time ago. And also, I'm an actor, and uh, I've I've kept travelling. I've kept working, and I've you know and lived in many many places. So it was a huge undertaking. And of course, I knew that they probably wouldn't, you know, they, there's no way they could really check up and find out whether I was telling the truth or not. But I, I used it as an exercise, and I thought, well, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll try and remember wh where I've been, where I've lived, where I've traveled. And it was through that process and these flashes of memory, and they came so strong that I had to write them down. And I wrote them down in a, in a blog form. And I was living in New York at the time, and... Um, and I just I kept writing, kept writing. And so eventually they let me in and, and I, I came to live in Canada. And, um, and I was asked to do a show, a reading of Shakespeare's. And I thought, well, that sounds very boring. Um, so, well, can I, can I just read some of these stories that I've, I've, you know, that I've, I've written down? And, uh, and they said, yeah, sure. And, and uh, so I went along and... Uh, as I was rehearsing, reading the stories, or rehearsing to read the stories, I realized that it wasn't going to be enough to read them. I was going to have to learn it. And, and so 
that's how the show came about. Is is really, and it took a long time. It took like three years for me to get up the courage to really say, "Is this, is this going to work dramatically? Is it going to work as a as a show?" And uh, so, over the course of last year, we took it to a, a, a few places in Brantford and Simcoe and Stratford, Ontario, and um, Hamilton, and. Uh, and everywhere we went, the, the show was, you know, it had a life. People kept coming up and, and kept wanting to put it on in other places. And um, and that's the reason I'm doing The Fringe, because somebody saw the show in Hamilton and said, I want to put you into the lottery for The Fringe. I, I didn't know there was a lottery for The Fringe. And uh, I said, well, OK. And then we got in, which is amazing. You know, it was the first time, it was the first time we tried. And... Then, of course, there was the, you know, do, can I do it? Because, you know, working actor, I, I don't know, I didn't know whether I was going to be available to do it. And just everything worked together. So I've just come back from uh, Washington, D.C. I was uh, doing uh, two Shakespeare's down at the Folger Theatre down there, Twelfth Night and Henry V. And it w- it's worked perfectly. I've, I've just finished. And here the, the fringe is, you know, has presented itself to me. So whatever it is, it's meant uh, why should people come to see it? That really isn't that really isn't something I can answer. I know that people who do come to see it identify with it. Also, the fringe is about theatre, and I suppose if you're interested in the actor and an actor's mind, and that is, uh, you know, that for better or for worse is what I am because I was born into it, and uh, I was born as it say in the piece the way it starts off is you know in Stratford upon Avon on Easter Sunday morning at 11 o'clock I was born <laughs> my parents were actors I was born in Stratford upon Avon on purpose you know and for my christening present I had a complete works of Shakespeare my first walk I was taken outside the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre and dedicated and I've known all my life that's what I was going to be and the piece I suppose is about the journey of someone pursuing his dream or his you know his artistic dream um and the the bumps and the the you know the personal story behind that but it's a it's a highly theatrical because it's actor it's actor based and theater and theater is is my life um it's it's not a it's not a conversational piece it's 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 heightened and uh that's it in a nutshell You, you Stratford, Stratford on Avon, and Shakespeare. Um, you mentioned that you just finished doing um, which character in Twelfth Night? Because what's one of my favorite plays? Malvolio. Oh, poor Malvolio. Yeah. Um, he was. He was. He was. It was exceptionally poor in this one because uh, the the way they imprisoned imprisoned him was I was uh, shut up inside a, a grand piano, a see through oh. grand piano. And I was in there for 23 minutes, which worked out over the course of the run that I was lying in this piano, which was very cramped, for 16 hours. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I've come back and I'm, <laughs> I'm learning how to walk again. <laughs> and um, in terms of you being an actor and embodying somebody like Malvolio and then now playing, are you playing yourself or are you playing in a character that's similar to yourself? In, in strolling player yeah it's a good question um, and it's it's not one you can really answer there's a sort of alchemy that goes on um, there's a part of yourself that you are playing there's a part that is I will say that you know when you're that when you're acting there's like 50% of you is empty or maybe more and then the character comes into that percentage and and that's what happens you get you get inhabited by the character through the clothes he wears through he takes you over but there's a there's a part of you that is you there's a part you'll find that is identified with that character there's a there's something that you'll find inside yourself but a lot of it is being um you know being taken over by the character well, Richard, thank you so much for joining us uh, today, Strolling Player at the Fringe. Um, the website for people who want to find out more. Uh, the website, yeah, let me. T- it's uh, richardwillis.org uh, forward slash sp5. And uh, on Twitter, it's at uh, Player Strolling. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. 
And I would like to thank my guests today who participated in the Five Minute Fringe. And uh, the Fringe is celebrating its 25th years of unforgettable theater, 148 shows. I was able to bring you nine, 35 venues. It runs from July 3rd to the 14th. 416-966-1062, 416-966-1062, or www.fringetoronto.com, fringetoronto.com. Thanks to my guests from the following shows, Strolling Player, Fort Isabel, Yarn, The Homemaker, Nobody's Idol, St. Francis Talks to the Birds, How to Become a Spinster, the Taliban don't like my knickers, cold comfort, and unfortunately, um, Alan Turner of Sour Grapes wasn't able to join us today. He was going to be my 10th show, but because of technical difficulties with the telephone, that wasn't able to happen. I will be doing a blog interview with Alan, so watch out for that on my blog, tmtmshow.blogspot.com, tmtmshow.blogspot.com.
Laura Ann Harris